So I'm used to lecturing, you know, giving a lecture and then coming back three or four or five days later and saying, last day, this is where we left off. Um, so 20 minutes ago, this is where we left off. Uh, and the only point that I wanted to make here is that if you want, there is a very, a very straightforward prescription for writing boundary observables in terms of bulk observables. And it's basically just given by some kind of limiting procedure where you take you know, that maybe uh, this is the value of you know, some operator corresponding to some electric field or something, and you just move that operator, you ask, you know, what is the operator corresponding to the field closer and closer and closer to the boundary, and in an appropriate limit, uh, you, you get, you know, there's a prescription that, for getting the boundary operator. The opposite direction is much trickier. My student, Jeff, pointed out that I made a little mistake here because I didn't actually do the integration by parts. And so what you actually learn is that's constant, not zero. Uh, but so thank you, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say it's not really the partial trace going from the um, from the bulk to the boundary, because the entire bulk is contained in the bound, like the entire bulk theory is contained in the boundary theory. It's an isomorphism. Uh, and so that's kind of the part of the mystery of ADS CFT, right? That if it were just a partial trace, then yeah, it would, or if it were, if it were just. Uh, uh, well, there, there's another element of the dictionary that I haven't described. That, that, you know, that then says, okay, you look at the, oper you know, the particular operator, uh, and based on its properties, you translate it uh, at the end of the day. Um, by, you can look at the properties of the operators, you get close to the boundary, and that uniquely describes an oper you know, a matching operator in the boundary theory. Um, and there's a prescription for doing that, but uh, yeah, I, I don't want to get too into it. All right, so the other direction, if, I have some bulk observable. So it's localized at a point. I'll, I'll draw the picture again. So this is, you, know, you can think of it as a question. You know, um, how is the electric field behaving at this point? Um, is the spin sitting there pointing up or down, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's some operator corresponding to that point. And we want to know how do you express that localized operator sitting deep inside the bulk in terms of boundary stuff. And back in 2006, uh, Hamilton, Kabat, Lifshitz, and Lowe, uh, Hamilton, Kabat, Lifshitz, Lowe, a um, little piece of trivia, Lifshitz is actually Dorita Rahanev's cousin. Um, so that's a, that's a distinguished family because her uncle is the you know, Arahanev of the Arahanev bohm effect. Um, they gave a prescription for doing this. Uh, and I don't want to get into too much detail about the, the details of the prescription, but the form of it is that you can write it as a linear combination of boundary observables, right? So there's going to be some bunch of boundary observables um, depending on many different angles now. Um, and actually, even at different times. And then there's some coefficients. So k, r, theta, theta tilde, t tilde. And it's a linear combination of all these things. So it's a sum, but theta tilde and t tilde are continuous, so really an integral. So it's some kind of integral over yeah, an infinite number of boundary things. So you have to take your boundary operators and you smear them according to some uh, coefficients. And the particular, actually, the structure of this matrix of coefficients is something that it's, it's known how to calculate, right? So they give a prescription for calculating it. And so it's something that you could work with. Um, and I won't say too much about how that matrix of coefficients is calculated, other than it involves solving 
partial differential equations that are related to the, uh, that are the, basically the field equations um, for the fields that are actually sitting in the bulk, right? And so those field equations, you know, signals propagate at the speed of light, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, the operators you need to have sitting here um, are somehow operators that are causally related to this phi. So it's a portion of the boundary that is properly causally related to this point, and you have to smear over that whole, whole region. So um, these things are causally related. to theta tilde, or to theta r. So that's, the, that's kind of as much as we need to know for the moment. And it has an important, you know, very important consequence. So the net result, so now let's take empty ADS, and I'll put my observable there. Um, if I draw the geodesic uh, connecting those two points, so I have some boundary region A, then the bulk operator sitting at that point, I can write it in terms of observables that are smeared out on A. So I don't need the whole boundary to do it. And in fact, I don't even need different times because I can use, you know, I can, I can, I can actually push it down to all fi some fixed time. So I can write phi entirely in terms of observable sitting on A. So, uh, so in general, I don't need the entire boundary to describe a bulk observable. I only need a portion of the boundary, right? But the portion that I need um, has to be uh, sitting inside this region mapped out by the geodesic. So this is a geodesic, at least for empty ADS. Um, and so if I move my point closer to the boundary, I could get by with a smaller uh, boundary region A, right? Whereas if I move my point deeper into the boundary, I need a larger boundary region A, or deeper into the bulk. And that's the, that's the upshot, right? That you don't need the entire boundary to, dis to describe a bulk observable, but you need a, you know, you need a portion of it. And the, how big a portion of the boundary you need depends on how deep that observable is in the boundary, right? And that actually jives with uh, the prescription that we have here. If we push a boundary observable all the way, a bulk observable all the way out to the boundary, it just becomes an observable at a given point. So you, you start, when you start to move it in, uh, it gets smeared over a larger and larger region. Okay. That's all well and good. Now, Almeri, Dong, and Harlow made a little observation back in 2014. They said, consider the following situation. I'm gonna put my observable right at the center, okay? And I'll cut the boundary into three pieces. I'll call them A1, A2, and A3. Then if I consider A1 and A2 together, right, the geodesic connecting their endpoints is this one, and phi is sitting inside the region uh, defined by A1 and A2, right, sitting inside. So I can write phi uh, only using boundary portion A1, A2. Now, can anyone describe any other portions of the boundary that would be sufficient for talking about, uh, for, for writing out phi? 
if I can do it using only A1 and A2. Yeah. Yeah, right. So A2, A3 has that geodesic. Uh, and then phi is uh, contained inside the region um, between A2, A3 and its geodesic. So, or A2, A3, or the last one, A1, A3. Right. Now, remember ADS-CFT was supposed to be an isomorphism. But now what we've learned is there are three different ways of writing this bulk observable as boundary observables. I can write it on A1, A2. I can write it on A2, A3. I can write it on A1, A3. So the map from bulk to boundary isn't unique. Right? That's kind of disturbing. It's supposed to be an isomorphism. Um, but I'll ask, I'll ask the audience, right? Are you familiar with any situations in which acting on different physical subsystems of a given system always have the same effect? And it's kind of a... Yeah, quantum error correcting codes, right? Uh, and so what we're actually seeing here is that there's a quantum error correcting code at work uh, that if I delete the portion A3 from the boundary, uh, then I still can act with phi on the system, right? Uh, that there's an observable corresponding to phi in the boundary that doesn't act on A3. That means I can, I can correct for the erasure of A3. Likewise, I can correct for the erasure of A1 and the erasure of A2. Um, and so... So the map to the boundary is not unique. And how is that possible? It's quantum error correction. So we can correct the erasure. of A1 or A2 or A3. We can't er correct the erasure of two of them, but we can correct the erasure of one. Uh, and, if, and obviously, if we rotated this by any angle, right? In fact, this is a very interesting, you know, it's an interesting quantum error, it's a very interesting quantum error correcting code. And so the reason, you know, it was known this map was not unique, but people were puzzled why, about why it was unique. We would not be puzzled at all as quantum information theorists because we'd say, oh, well, this map only works for the, on the code subspace, right? Um, and it's not actually, we're not giving a prescription for phi that works in every possible state of the system, only inside a code subspace. And inside the code subspace, there's no reason that this, this uh, uh, map from logical operators to physical operators has to be unique. Um, so I'm just gonna write down a big dictionary about ADS-CFT relating ADS-CFT to quantum error correction. And to the extent that you're familiar with quantum error correction, when you hear people using words that aren't familiar to you in ADS-CFT, you just translate in your head, and much of, what they, much of what they say should suddenly become sensible. So we'll have our quantum error correction language, and we'll have our ADS-CFT language. So we have our physical qubits. That's, you know, in a quantum error correcting code, you start off with some physical qubits. What are the physical qubits here? They're the boundary, right? So this is the, the boundary, and it's really fields, but you, know, you just think of it as a bunch of qubits you know, on a ring or whatever it is, right? So it's just your, your boundary fields. Um, we have, a code subspace to define a quantum error correcting code. So what is the code subspace here? Well, you have different choices about what you could do. Um, there's a lot of freedom in that. Uh, but a starting point would just be to say, well, let's take a fixed geometry and allow ourselves 
some low energy excitations of the field sitting on top of that geometry, right? So you can rotate some spins, inject a little bit of energy here and there, but not enough that you're gonna significantly change the, the geometry, right? That you'll have some back reaction from general relativity. So it's just going to be, uh, let's say, field excitations in a fixed background. Right, that if you allow yourself to put one unit of energy over here into that field, one unit over there, et cetera, et cetera, you smear them out enough, and then you take the linear combination of all the states that you've made, you get a subspace of all the, all the states in the quantum gravity theory. Right? So it's a subspace of the full CFT Hilbert space, uh, and that's what we'll call the code. Right? Um, and so our physical operators, are just our boundary operators. Uh, do, 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 do. Our logical operators, they're the interesting ones. What do you think a logical operator is? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So the bulk operators are the things that act in some interesting way in the code subspace. Uh, right, so they're, they're operators that change the state of the field inside the bulk, right? Uh, and so those are our logical operators. And this is, yeah, this is now the, this is the structure of ADS-CFT. Um, and erasure recovery, recovery what does erasure recovery say in a quantum error correcting code? It tells you that if you don't have access to some subset of the qubits, there's, a, there's an observable acting on the remaining ones that, you know, that gives you the logical operator that you're interested in, right? And so this is just saying that the, uh, there's some locality uh, in our physical representation of bulk operators. And the locality is roughly the, the, what I was describing before, right? That you only need a portion of the boundary to reconstruct or to, uh, to describe an observable in the bulk. Um, and then we can talk about some of these surprises, right? So um, in a quantum error correcting code, as I was saying before, there are generally many physical operators implementing the same logical operator, right? It's just the way it is, right? And in fact, it's important that that's the case because that's what gives you the error correcting property, right? You can, you can apply the same logical operation in multiple different ways. So many physical operations for the same uh, logical operation. which is just a fact about quantum error correction. It's not, a it's not a mystery, it's just the way it works, right? And it's a necessity. Uh, but on the ADS-CFT side, it was a conceptual puzzle, right? This was precisely the non-uniqueness of the map from bulk to boundary. And so, just by realizing that what's going on is a quantum error correcting code, we've dispensed with hours upon hours upon hours of you know, confused discussion that occurred in high energy physics uh, departments um, about why this mapping should be non-unique. Uh, the overall correspondence between the full quantum gravity theory and the boundary theory can be an isomorphism, but once you restrict to the code subspace, uh, then you could have many physical operators for the same logical operator. Um, and moreover, Kind of an obvious fact, uh, the physical operators you use to implement your logical operator depend on your choice of code, right? Obviously, right? So your physical operators are code dependent.
Well, on the quantum gravity side, people were confused about the fact that the prescription for mapping bulk to boundary operators depended on the state that you were in, right? Depended on the background. And that introduced a nonlinearity. Well, that's not a surprise. It's just the fact that you are restricting to a subspace. Uh, and then your choice of physical operators can depend non-linearly non on your choice of subspace. Right? That's just also not a surprise. Right? So the things that people were bending over backwards, confusing themselves about, thinking, oh, do we have to modify quantum mechanics to make quantum gravity work? No, you know, it's just quantum mechanics, it's quantum error correction. So are there, are there yeah? How do we know it can't be some, like, some gauge freedom or something? Um, well, I guess in this case, I mean, maybe you could rephrase it in other language as some gauge freedom. I mean, I'm not gonna rule that out, but the, the quantum error correction framework is precisely what's going on, right? Like, you, you, um, we do have a code, you know, we do have a subspace of states that we're looking at. We do have the ability to correct erasures, right? And so um, it's just a fact that you can interpret ADS-CFT in a fixed background uh, as a quantum error correcting code. So maybe you can interpret some other way uh, as well, and the, you know, that will have uh, other different advantages conceptually, but I think that this is, um, it's not, it's not conjecture, well, AD, the whole ADS-CFT is conjecture, but assuming that the sort of basic structure is as we expect, this is not a conjecture, it's just an observation about what's happening. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so the nonlinearity on the right-hand side was the statement that in here, if I wanted to figure out how to, I mean, there, there are various nonlinearities, but say there's this one. How do I write my bulk operator, which is now my logical operator, in terms of physical operators, which are my boundary operators? I solve some partial differential equation, but the equation I solve depends on the background geometry. And the background geometry is a feature of the quantum gravity state, right? The geometry itself is you know, the, um, a dynamical thing that, uh, that, it, that is supposed to be emergent. And so the fact that you were solving equations that yeah, to calculate observables, but the observables you were, you were extracting depended on the state you started in, right? This was a, a state-dependent transformation, so a nonlinearity. Um, and it's just, not a, it's just not an issue when you look at it from this perspective. Um, restricting yourself to this subspace of states that's defined by some given geometry um, is just saying you've, choos you've chosen a code subspace, and the physical operators um, appropriate for that code space will be different than the physical operators for some other code subspace. And the mapping will, you know, from code subspace to operators um, is not even necessarily a well-defined thing. I mean, there, there, there is a potentially freedom there, um, but it can certainly be, you know, it can certainly be nonlinear. Like there's no, there, there's just no problem. So the point is more that this stuff on the right-hand side, that people, you know, in that community where uh, people worried about these things, it was confusing. But you shouldn't you know, get too hung up on why it was confusing because it isn't confusing. It's, yeah, it's just the way, <laughs> just what you'd expect. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, oh, lots of questions. Yeah. Yes. No, that's a, no, so that's a really good point. So, um, it, it is, now people debate, yeah, right, so I said at the beginning there should just be an isomorphism, um, and there's actually some debate about whether it truly is an isomorphism, uh, that maybe the CFT can't capture everything that happens in the quantum gravity theory, uh, but in practice, when people do ADS, ADS CFT, they don't, use the isomorphism, because no one knows how the whole big isomorphism works. And so they restrict, right? They say, okay, let's think about these situations where uh, we might have these fields perturbatively coupled to gravity, 
uh, and, we, you know, and, we, and we have a, a, a little situation, we perturb it a little bit and we see what happens. And that, that's what they actually calculate. So when people were actually doing ADS CFT calculations, they were working in this framework typically. Not, you know, they, they, in the back of their minds, they might have had some, some isomorphism, but no one knows how to write down that isomorphism in general. Um, and so I think it, it, it actually is legitimately an open question uh, whether it really is an isomorphism or something more subtle. I said it was at the beginning, but you know, some people would debate that point. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's a, in quantum error correction, there's a notion of, uh, oh, I see. Ah. Yes, right, so in quantum error correction, you just have your physical qubit Hilbert space and that's it, right? And so here, there is an additional level of identification going on because the code subspace has some physical interpretation, right? Uh, and the physical interpretation of the code subspace is as something that doesn't manifestly exist inside the, uh, the physical Hilbert space, but that's not so different than quantum error correction. Right, that in quantum error correction, uh, you know, suppose that you were trying to implement some quantum computation and you have some logical qubits, you encode them into physical qubits, and then you have some logical circuit and you represent the action of that logical circuit on the logical qubits by actions of physical qubits that don't look anything like them at all, right? And so it's really, kind of, it's really the same thing that's happening, right? That there's some, a whole set of logical operators that describe uh, the observables that are relevant to the bulk theory, um, and you represent them in terms of the, the boundary theory, the physical qubits. The, the place where there's a little bit of, and we'll talk about this in more detail, but where there is some distinction is that there's some approximation that necessarily has to happen in ADSC that isn't necessary in usual quantum error correction, right? That if, there, if, if all of this were exact, then, um, then you would probably find that you actually had number of degrees of freedom in the bulk theory scaling like volume rather than like area, for example, right? That something ha you, some, some things have to be approximate, um, but the, the spirit of it all is the same. Yeah. Um, so the boundary will be larger than the code subspace and the different possible, so if you think of the different possible background geometries that you might be interested in, each of those will be a different code uh, and, maybe, and maybe there's even more than, uh, and you, pa you package all of those together, those are still actually going to be a small piece of the boundary Hilbert space because the boundary will also contain crazy states, right? Just you know, if you choose some totally arbitrary generic state of the boundary theory, there's no reason to expect that it has any geometry attached to it whatsoever, right? So there are also tons of theories in the, you know, in the CF, or tons of states in the CFT that you don't even expect to look like geometry at all. And so uh, from that perspective, this kind of thing is just a very you know, special collection of subspaces in the CFT. Yeah, um, so it's a good question. Um, and I, I guess all I take from that is that that's one of the reasons that it's easier to make um, ADS holographic than it is to make flat space or de Sitter space, something more like our universe holographic. Because uh, de Sitter or anti-de Sitter is sort of secretly holographic itself a little bit. Like it, it, it's, it's sort of built in. If you do the d counting of degrees of freedom, you're right. Uh, It's possible. Um, 
Now, there is actually, um, <laughs> there's something like ADS-CFT for asymptotically flat space. This was developed by Banks, Fischler, Schenker, and, uh, and Susskind, the BF BFSS matrix models, and those are holographic. Um, and so it seems to work, it, it hasn't been done for de Sitter space, yeah, like for the, something more like our universe, but for asymptotically flat space, where you don't just get the holography for free, uh, it works. Um, uh, we don't know. It's on the to-do list to see how much of this you can translate over. Yeah. Okay. I should probably um, continue moving forward just a little bit. Uh, I want to make use of this to do something interesting, right? So, so far, this is just uh, an observation useful to someone in the quantum information community because now when people use these words uh, on the right-hand side in ADSCFT, just secretly in your brain, translate them to the appropriate quantum error correction term, and most of what you know, people will be saying will sound uh, natural and maybe even obvious. Um, but this observation uh, was applied, again, by Almeri, Dong, and Harlow to helping to sort out one of the big questions, not completely sorting it out, but helping to sort out one of the big questions about ADS-CFT. How does this radial direction of the bulk emerge? Right? How does that happen? Um, so, what do I call this? Yeah, bulk locality. So, you're a quantum information audience. Uh, I'm a quantum information guy. At least I was born that way. Um, so we can have an Alice, right? And Alice has her Hilbert space, H sub A. And here's Bob, who has his Hilbert space, H sub B. Um, and of course, an observable, or an, an operator for Alice acts on her Hilbert space, O sub A. Um, and in terms of the larger tensor product Hilbert space, it acts as the tensor product of O sub A with an identity on the B system, right? Uh, and likewise, a Bob operator acting on Bob's Hilbert space, um, in the larger Hilbert space, acts as identi identity on the A system tensored with an observable on the Bob operator, right? And as a result, well, so let's give these things names. O tilde A will be the operator acting on the whole Hilbert space, but corresponding to Alice doing something. And O tilde B will be the operator acting on the whole Hilbert space corresponding to Bob doing something. And what happens if we commute these two operators? This is an exercise. Feel free to put up your hand. Yeah. Zero. Yes, good. So they commute. Um, and this is basically an indication that the observables on A and the observables on B are acting on independent subsystems of some quantum system. And in fact, this is the better way of talking about uh, independent subsystems than the tensor product way. Uh, some of you may have followed the, you know, there's talk at QIP last year, uh, about, I guess by Thomas Vidic, uh, about serial systems problem, right? And it's related to whether uh, when you, when you think about non-locality, it's sufficient uh, to think about tensor product Hilbert spaces with observables acting with the tensor product, or you th should think about commuting subalgebras of some larger algebra of observables. And so this is actually the kind of the a priori, the best way to start off talking about independent subsystems. So, this, so the fact that if this is true, if, if when we have the observables for, for Alice, all of Alice's observables commute with all of Bob's observables, then we, con then we conclude uh, that A and B are independent subsystems. That's sort of the definition, right? And in, certainly in quantum field theory, uh, this is the, the, basic pro the basic property that uh, operators acting on spatially uh, separated points uh, the property that they have is that they commute. 
And that reflects the fact that in quantum field theory, you have effectively, but not, you know, not quite strictly true, roughly speaking, a Hilbert space you know, over here and a Hilbert space over there, and they're independent subsystems, right? And so if we want to see the emergence of bulk locality uh, in ADS-CFT, what we want to see is that spatially separated bulk operators commute, right? So, um, yeah, so that's what we want to look for. Um, we want to ask the question, if we put two operators inside the bulk and they're spatially separated, uh, will they commute with each other, right? Uh, and if they do commute with each other, then what we're seeing is that the bulk is organizing itself into independent subsystems, right? And this is basically uh, kind of a prior condition for uh, some radial direction to occur, or to, to emerge, right? If, if two operators that are radially separated actually commute, uh, then that's telling you that this radial direction is emerging from somewhere. So let's see if it's true. So I have two operators acting inside the bulk, and they're spatially separated, right? They're space-like separated. And the question is, once I map them to the boundary, are they going to uh, be commuting operators? Well, let's call that region A. This region is A complement. If I can find, at least in empty ADS, a geodesic separating phi one from phi two, right? then I know that I can write phi one entirely as an operator on A bar, right? So my phi one is going to go to some operator on A bar, right? It's, a, it's the same rule that we were using up here. And phi two is gonna get mapped to some operator. Well, where, where is phi two going to, do, going to go? It's sitting between A and the geodesic, so I'll be able to write it entirely in terms of operators on A. But now A and A bar are disjoint subsystems of the boundary theory, right? And the boundary theory is a local theory, a quantum field theory. And so the observables in A bar commute with the observables of A up to like, the places where they touch, and you know, maybe we just thicken this out by a tiny little bit. Uh, and so on the boundary, we have that OA bar commutes with OA. And so this implies that in the bulk, phi 1 commutes with phi 2, um, at least in the code subspace. And so just kind of understanding the way that bulk operators are mapped out to the boundary uh, as this quantum error correct, you know, uh, with this quantum error correcting property really allows us to see, and I think this is the best argument out there right now, for why you start, or, or for the existence of independent subsystems uh, at spatially separated points in the bulk theory. If you're asking, you know, where does the radial direction come from? It comes from, you know, it comes from quantum error correction. Right. So are, are there questions about that? Yeah. Uh, well, so the radial direction, I, I guess it's any, the argument works for any direction. Um, at least out at the boundary, the boundary theory had locality in the angular direction. Maybe it, it, maybe it didn't survive into the bulk. But the, you know, so that the, the biggest mystery was the radial direction because that didn't even exist in the boundary. Um, but, yeah. What happens when one of these points approaches the center? 
what happens if the point is at the center? Yeah, is that? The, what does the region that depends on the boundary for the boundary? Uh, the, the one at the center actually only needs two thirds, well, it doesn't necessarily need two thirds, but it, even at the center you can use less than the whole boundary. You can use two thirds of the boundary. Yeah. Um, and so, it's an important point, though. Like, in empty ADS, this argument works you know, for, for all operators. But if you start to put matter in the theory, uh, then there will actually be regions where you can't, uh, where these space-like geodesics from the, uh, from the boundary, the, the, or the, short, or the shortest, shortest space-like geodesics, don't penetrate into all points in the bulk. And so there, there are points in the bulk where you're not able to actually make this argument. Uh, where you, you can't find these geodesics that separate two points. Um, so that, so this, does, this doesn't work in all cases, but it gives you some indication of what's happening um, frequently. Yeah. Okay. So I've been talking about holography quite a bit uh, and quantum gravity, but these lectures, or these lectures, two lectures, I, I wanted to give you an indication that quantum information theoretic ideas have been powerful not only in quantum gravity, but in other aspects of high energy physics. Um, and so I'm going to take a little aside uh, and speak about a different, a different topic um, and then come back to holography if there's time at the end. So I'll leave the dictionary, erase this. We're going to talk about something called renormalization. So this is something near and dear to all quantum field theorists' hearts. Um, but, and in about 20 minutes, we should be able to derive something which is a, a deep result uh, in quantum field theory. You don't need to know any quantum field theory. Uh, that people, well, th there's a long story behind. So what is renormalization about? So, you know, the actual theory as far, well, the best theory we have right now about our universe, or well, not, say about the particle content of our universe is the standard model. And maybe if you zoomed in on a hydrogen atom, you'd see a couple of up quarks and a, oops, down quark. Uh, and you'd see an electron kind of waving around and so on, right? Uh, that the, the standard model has all of these particles, right? The, up, the, the quarks, the, uh, the gluons, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, and that's the, the content of the, the Higgs particle of the standard model. But if you just want to do atomic physics, right? You don't need to know about this stuff, right? You say, oh, well, if I kind of zoom out a little bit, then what I really see here is just a proton and an electron. And it's enough for me to talk about quantum electrodynamics. And I don't need you know, the weak force and the strong force and the Higgs mechanism and all that stuff, right? I have a perfectly good theory that will discuss uh, yeah, atomic physics uh, without having to get into the guts. Um, and you can even zoom up from here. You, know, you eventually get people thinking about quantum mechanics. And the appropriate way for reasoning about those people is psychology rather than you know, particle physics. Um, and the point is that at different levels of description, you have different good effective theories. Uh, this one might be qualitatively different than the others. Uh, and, and so it's an important question in physics, uh, what microscopic descriptions are gonna have the same zoomed out coarse grain description, right? That if people are trying to figure out, well, what physics is there beyond the standard model? What stuff can we drop in? What did, you know, uh, that, that won't affect the physics that we've actually measured so far, uh, but that would have different you know, 
different behavior at higher energies, you have to understand this process, right? And this is the process of renormalization. There's a whole uh, formalism in quantum field, quantum field theory for how you actually do this, how you study the way that the theory actually, ch the, the way the theory changes as you change scales. So, um, uh, And this is important in condensed matter theory, or condensed matter physics as well, right? Again, in this room, uh, there's a good chance, you know, some fraction of you talk about various you know, spin models for magnetism or you know, uh, you know, Hubbard model for superconductivity, et cetera, et cetera. And those models don't look anything like the actual microscopic physics. And yet, uh, if, you, if you zoom out enough, uh, they are thought to be good the, the coarse grain descriptions effectively capture the real physics that's seen in the world, right? And that's because under renormalization, those physics that have the wrong microscopic descriptions, uh, they coarse grain to something that actually has the right macro, you know, zoomed out description. Um, and so people want to understand what they call renormalization group flow, right? So they want to know under coarse graining, uh, you know, what happens? Um, and so there's some partial order, right? Uh, on, on these theories, you know, who, what can map to what under the coarse graining. Um, and they want tools to understand uh, the structure of this ordering. And in this community, uh, I think people have thought a lot about situations where there are irreversible relationships between states uh, and you know, some ordering on them and how you make sense of that. Um, you know, the, whole, you know, the whole story of entanglement and then resource theories and so on and so forth. Uh, and so this is a lot, you know, the, and so what, what's the natural thing to do? Try to find monotones, right, under this coarse graining. Monotone, renormalization monotones. And, well, There are such things. And the first example of a monotone result to be found was for one plus one dimensional relativistic quantum field theories uh, by Zemnologikov back in 1986. So um, he found some function that when you coarse grained the theory, uh, always decreased or increased. That's yeah, yeah, a matter of sign. Um, and, and coarse graining uh, has an additional property that at a certain point, uh, if, you're, if you reach a fixed point of coarse graining, what you've found is a theory that is scale invariant, right? That's what a fixed point of coarse graining is going to be. Uh, and so at the fixed point of coarse graining, uh, it turned out that his monotone was equal to something called the central charge of the theory, which is a property that the uh, scale-free uh, field theories have. So he, he found this thing back in 1986, um, and I think this paper was notorious, right? At least, you know, among, you know, I'm not a high energy theorist, but I have students who are and friends who are, and, you know, some of them shudder at the, at the name Zemblodzikov because his papers are, are, are really difficult. Um, but I will show you how to derive not the same result because this is a different monotone, but it has the same value at the fixed points. Um, and all we need is entropy, and entropy inequalities, and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, so what we're going to try to do, uh, it turns out that we're going to try to find a function which is monotonic under coarse graining in a theory. Uh, and that, that is enough. Um, sorry? Ah, uh, so <laughs> operationally, um, you can try to think about the effective theory that you get when you al only allow yourself observables that are smeared out over some region, uh, and then you derive 
the, the Hamiltonian for that effective theory. Now, a priori, it's not a Hamiltonian, right? It, it's some open system because you've thrown away degrees of freedom. But for certain classes of, the, of theories, there's you know, this separation that allows you to do that. Uh, and then the statement is that under that process, um, the, the Hamiltonian no longer changes. Okay, so we're talking about relativistic quantum field theories. Um, and all we need to know uh, is a little, well, we, we need to know a little bit about uh, relativity and quantum mechanics, but not a lot. So here I have time, and here I have space. And imagine that I specify the state on this horizontal line. So there's some density operator there. Okay. Now influences, because it's a relativistic theory, influences from outside the horizontal line uh, will not be able to penetrate inside this triangle. Right? And as a result, if I draw another space-like surface inside the triangle, the map from the density operator on the horizontal line upwards is a unitary map, okay? Because no information comes in and no information leaks out. Uh, and so on all of these space-like surfaces, they're all related by unitary transformations, the, the density operators. And so the entropy on all of those space-like surfaces will be the same. So, Uh, and so you should really, you, you could even associate the entropy with the diamond instead of associating it with the, uh, the region of space if you wanted to, because the, uh, the entropy is the same everywhere. Uh, so to find this monotone under rescaling, hmm. We're just going to have to calculate, or we're just going to think about a few entropies. So I'll draw a big diamond. Line here, there, there, there. So I have four space like surfaces. One, two, three, four. I'll call these W, X, Y, and Z. Okay? And the lines are at 45 degrees, right? Remember, my speed of light is, uh, is equal to one. So these lines are, uh, are null rays, they're, uh, they're paths that light could, could, uh, could take. And in this geometry, if we think of the lengths of W, X, Y, and Z, so they're line segments, but I'll just associate the symbols also with their lengths, then W times Z is equal to X times Y. So that's something you can check, right? Just use some analytic geometry, choose some coordinates. Can you just clarify what W, X, Y, and Z are again? Uh, yeah. So this is still a space-time diagram. And we, it really is one plus one dimensional, so it's just one spatial coordinate. Uh, and these are line segments, right, in space-time. Um, and they're all space-like line segments, right? Uh, because they're, yeah, they're, their slope is less than 45 degrees. Um, and I've made this uh, kind of figure eight configuration with them. That's, that's the only property that they have. Uh, and their endpoints sit on this, uh, this null triangle. Which line segment is X? Sorry? Which line segment is X? Oh, I'm sorry. X is this one here, yeah. Yeah, 
And y is this one here. But it's the whole thing. Oh, I'm, oh, I see. Oh, sorry for the confusion. Uh, let me double check I'm getting this right. One sec. Okay. Is that better? <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, the correction politely rephrased as a question. Um, yeah. So you can verify uh, that this geometry implies that this, uh, this relation holds between the lengths of those line segments. Um, okay? Uh, and that means that I can write... Let's see if I can get this right. Y is equal to lambda W, where lambda is equal to Z over X, and Z is equal to lambda x, where this is equal to y over w. OK? So I, I just uh, I just done some fractions. Uh, was very nervous about making a mistake. And the way that this is set up, um, the, that ratio lambda is larger than or equal to 1. So lambda is going to be my rescaling. OK? Uh, and now I am going to introduce two more lines line segments, so I'll call them alpha and beta. So alpha is the line segment from this leftmost point to the intersection of x with the null ray, right? So just this piece here. And beta is the corresponding uh, line segment on the right-hand side. So that's all the, uh, yeah, I had to draw a bunch of line segments up there. Hopefully it's... Hopefully this will be worth the, uh, yeah. This, set, this setup. Now what do we know about entropy? Mark, <laughs> what properties does entropy have? <laughs> yes, excellent answer, yeah. <laughs> All right, so. Let's apply strong subadditivity to this situation. Uh, so I can think about the entropy of the, of the, the state defined on alpha and w together, right? Because, well, how do I construct that state? I start with a state on z, and I push it upwards uh, in an appropriate way, right? Uh, and then I'll think of the entropy on W and beta. And this is at least as big as the entropy on alpha, W, and beta, plus the entropy on W. OK, strong subadditivity, right? Uh, now, alpha, W. I can make the state on alpha and w by starting with the state on y, right? That they're in the, uh, that the, the argument about pushing forward with a unitary transformation, no information comes out or, es or escapes between y and alpha w, right? And so the entropy of alpha w will be the same as the entropy of y, right? that I can just push upwards from y to w uh, without, a lot, without requiring any information to come out, uh, come from the outside into, into uh, the causal diamond or uh, having any, any information leak out of the causal diamond. Likewise, if I take w and beta together, I can make the state on w and beta by acting unitarily on this segment, which is x.
and then alpha w beta, all three of them together, well, I can make that by pushing forward, uh, you know, or by unitarily transforming the state on z. Right, that's, an that's a direct example of what we had right here. So this is the, st the same as the entropy of z. And so now I have a bunch of individual line segments. Uh, and I'm just going to use my observation up there. Is that going to work for us? So the entropy of y is the entropy of a state on the y line segment, right? But this, I, I'm interested in relativistic quantum field theories. Now let's say we're going to talk about the ground state of the theory. So the ground state is the same if I boost, right? Under, under uh, relativistic boosts, the ground state doesn't change in a relativistic theory. Uh, and so the entropy of y will be the same as the entropy of any line segment of the same size in any other boosted theory, or boosted frame. So I can say, well, y has the same length as lambda times w. So its entropy will be the same. And z has the same length as lambda times x. So this is uh, takes the ground state to the ground state. All right. Well, so that was just a little bit of you know, some minor information theory, some, uh, some strong sub-additivity. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, so, yeah. So lambda w, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 using, I'm using this notation. So y is both a line segment and the length of that, y, of that line segment. So lambda times w is the length uh, of the W line segment um, multiplied by the scaling factor lambda. And so down here, uh, what I mean by this is the entropy of a line segment of length lambda W. Yes. Exactly. Sorry? If it's in the vacuum state. In the vacuum, yeah. Oh. All right, so we can say that the entropy of x minus the entropy of w is at least as big as the entropy of lambda times x minus the entropy of lambda times w. It's not such a big deal, right? Uh, it doesn't seem like such a big deal, but what we've done is we've found some function which is monotonic under rescaling of the length of, in, uh, of these intervals, right? Uh, and it, you know, there's an argument to be made, but that is actually all you need to do to construct a monotone for, uh, for renormalization. So we've constructed a renormalization monotone. Um, and we can clean this up just a little bit. So there's our monotone. And that this is a function of the length of two intervals to construct the monotone. Uh, but if you define C of R is equal to, or C of, let's say, L for length, is the length times the derivative of the entropy with respect to the length. Uh, 
So this is some function that's now just the function of one length. Uh, and uh, and it turns out this function is also monotone. And you can conclude that this function is monotone by actually taking x to w. So you take x is equal to 1 plus delta times w, and you let lambda equal to 1 plus epsilon, right? So here I'm allowing myself to rescale by arbitrary amounts, and I'm allowing arbitrary length intervals. So now I'm saying, think about the situation where the length of the two intervals you're going to talk about are infinitesimally close to each other, right? Uh, then if you take this inequality here and expand it uh, in powers of delta and epsilon, then the order delta epsilon part of the expansion for star, which again you can do at home if you like, uh, gives that C prime of L is less than or equal to zero. So what does this mean? We had a monotone, and for any pair of intervals, right, or any, any pair of lengths of intervals, uh, we, got some, yeah, we got some monotone. So now I'm just saying, well, specialize to the case where we take two intervals that are arbitrarily close together. Uh, and just using this inequality, uh, you can derive, you know, by, by just looking at the limit, uh, this other inequality, right? So the limit gives you, a, uh, gives you a derivative of the entropy instead of the original entropy. Um, now, why is this desirable? This actually takes us back to the calculation we did at the very beginning of, uh, of these lectures. Um, because our fixed points... of renormalization are CF conformal field theories, are CFTs, right? Conformal field theory is scale invariant. Uh, and so uh, if, you, if you keep rescaling and rescaling and rescaling, at some point you should hit a fixed point, uh, and that fixed point is going to be a CFT. Um, and if, those, if that CFT is a CFT, uh, that has an ADS dual, then we know how to calculate the entropy, right? Um, and that tells us that the entropy at L um, should be equal to some constant, you know, 1 over 4 G Newton, times the logarithm of L over epsilon. Right, that's, what we, that's what we actually calculated. Right? We worked out that uh, in ADS-CFT, the Ryu Takinagi formula told us that the entropy was equal to, up to a constant, the length of the uh, shortest geodesic. And we calculated the length of that shortest geodesic right at the start. And so we have a formula for what the entropy looks like at the fixed points. Um, and this uh, is more frequently written That there's some, there's some parameter associated with conformal field theories known as the central charge. They call it C. Uh, and this 1 over 4 G Newton is related to the central charge this way. And so at the fixed points, um, we know how to calculate the entropy. And we can plug, it, you know, we can plug in this formula. Uh, let's call it C, I don't know, C tilde, so we don't get confused. Um, our formula for the, at the fixed point is that C of L, if we take this derivative, entropy with respect to length, uh, we're just going to get the prefactor out. Right. Yeah. So, uh, 
I might have gone a little bit quickly there. The, let, let's just go through that briefly, quickly, or br go through that a little bit again. The, the question, right, is just a general question about, about field theory. When you rescale, right, when you renormalize, you, uh, you convert one theory into another theory. And people really care uh, what the structure of uh, that transformation on theories looks like. And they have very little handle on it. But monotones, as we know from resource theory, give us some handle on which theories can be transformed into which other ones, right? Uh, and by constructing a function which always decreases as we zoom out, which is what we did up here, we got a monotone under this coarse greening process. And then this last, uh, this last slide here is just an attempt to kind of clean up, this make this monotone a little bit nicer to work with and related to quantities that people are familiar with in, uh, in conformal field theory. So if we take the monotone we started with, uh, which was a function of two parameters, we can construct a monotone of a single parameter by just taking an appropriate limit, right, where one of the intervals approaches the other one. Uh, and if you do that, you can extract a new monotone, uh, and that new monotone has the property that when you hit a fixed point of the rescaling, when you hit one of these conformal field theories, that new monotone is just what's called the central charge of the conformal field theory. And so this is what Zemnolodchikov achieved in 1986 in this very famous paper that makes people scared. Uh, he, you know, he used the covariance of the stress tensor and something called reflection positivity and a lot of machinery. Uh, and out of that machinery, he also found a monotone uh, that in, at fixed points was equal to the central charge. But we've done it. Um, I don't know if you completely followed, but hopefully you've roughly followed. And, and hopefully you followed enough to reach the conclusion that with relatively little extra work, you could understand this argument. Uh, I can assure you that's not really true for Zemlochikov's original argument. And so it took, you know, it was 20 years, right? So th this argument is due to Cassini and Huerta in 2006 or 2007. Uh, so 20 years after Zemlochikov's original paper, uh, for anyone to come up with an easy way of doing this. Um, and this is for one plus one dimensional field theories. Uh, there, there were then a series of results. Uh, you know, how do you find a monotone for two plus one dimensional the field theories for three plus one dimensional field theories. And those t the, the papers deriving these results are kind of landmarks in quantum field theory and all very difficult and often using very different techniques, one from the next. Um, and now Cassini and Huerta and their collaborators have actually generalized all those results. Um, so for field theories that are three plus one dimensional and smaller, these monotones can all be constructed in a systematic way. Um, and it's more complicated than what I wrote here, but it's in the same spirit. Uh, they don't know how to do it in higher dimensions yet, so there's more work to be done. Um, but this is really a case where quantum information theoretic thinking just guides you, it, you know, it guides you to the right, uh, the place that you want to get to much more easily. And that's not really surprising, right? Because entropy functions behave nicely under coarse graining, right? That's one of the, one of the nice properties. That's what they're for. Uh, and so because renormalization is ultimately about coarse graining, it's not a surprise that you should be able to reason about it effectively using information theory. Uh, but now that, you know, that, that goal has been realized. Are there, are there questions? Yeah. What does entropy mean? S of X minus S of W is a difference. It seems the difference is kind of interesting. Oh, the difference, yeah, the difference is, you know, it's kind of a coherent information or a conditional entropy. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. Um, and, and this is something that hasn't been very explored, actually, because, uh, so Nima Lashkari has been working on these sorts of questions. I think, that you can, I don't know how far it goes, but you can construct these monotones using various kinds of Renyi entropies, not just with the von Neumann entropy, you know, using the, the sandwich Renyi entropies and so on. And in principle, you, you get a whole family of monotones, whereas before there was at most one at a given dimension. So now we have you know, whole uh, infinite families of monotones. 
but I don't think anyone's been able to evaluate them uh, and be able to, you know, like the, what would be really beautiful would be able to, you know, to pick some theories and people didn't know if they, float, if, they re, if they flowed to the same point to be able to say, no, they can't actually go to the same point because their monotones are different. Or, uh, so that, that hasn't been a, you know, there hasn't been a kind of uh, an application of that type yet, but maybe it's on the horizon. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think um, where well, renormalization is an allowed operation. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, what renormalization is, it's constraining you not to zoom in, right? It, it's telling you that all of your observables are fuzzed out over some length scale. And so that's a very natural constraint to impose from an operational perspective. Uh, and it imposes a directionality. Um, so I don't think anyone has looked at this from like a resource theory type perspective uh, other than constructing monotones. Um, but because it's usually associated with, with this, all ex this extra machinery. Um, like I, I should say that for example, all of this was in the relativistic setting. And I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I believe that nothing is like monotones are just not known in non-relativistic quantum field theory. I think they're just no known, no known examples. Uh, even though you might think, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's zooming out, uh, it's losing information, there should be natural monotones, no one's been able to construct any yet. Um, so it's a job for us, maybe. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left, right? Let me just think for a second about hmm? because I 12. 12, okay. Well, maybe, maybe I'll tell you a little, I'll, I'll come back to this question of the quantum error correcting code for a few minutes. Uh, because that's, uh, obviously this is where quantum information is playing a significant role. Uh, but I'd just like to tell you a little bit about how things have been pushed forward. And then I'll, I'll end by just listing a few of the areas that I haven't talked about today because there are lots of other exciting applications of quantum information to high energy that just have not been part of this discussion at all. Um, so, the Ryu Takinagi formula. Um, what I gave you was just the, the first term in an expansion for the entropy. Uh, and so, a more precise formula. We always have to have our, our slice of ADS, our region A. And somehow the, the portion that we've talked about the area of this mineral surface, the length of the geodesic, uh, that, that accounts for somehow the entanglement of the quantum gravity degrees of freedom, uh, which we don't even know exactly what they are. Uh, but in this, in this theory, we also have uh, degrees of freedom, these bulk fields that are living in the background, right? And if I choose some surface here, in general, you know, if you have some local physical theory, uh, the degrees of freedom that are nearby with each other are going to be entangled, right? And so there's an additional contribution to the entropy which comes from the entanglement of the bulk fields, right? On top of the sort of the entanglement that represents the geometry. And so what you should actually be doing here is saying one over or the minimum over curves or surfaces that are homologous to the boundary region A of the area uh, of gamma, what we were calling the length, but in higher dimensions, it's an area, over 4G, plus, I'll say, the entropy of the bulk fields. So in the definition of homology, remember there was a bulk region, little a, uh, 
that actually, I don't think I gave it a name, we call this the entanglement wedge. So this is the part of the bulk that, uh, that gamma and A together are the boundary of, right? Uh, and so we have to include the area term, and then we also have to just include the entropy of the density operator corresponding to the, the fields that are living on that background. Okay, so there are two contributions. The first one you should think of as the entropy is, that describes the geometry, right? It's like the black, you know, the, a black hole has an entropy. That's not, uh, that just reflects its geometry. And then there's also some entropy that, uh, that reflects the entanglement of the degrees of freedom living in the geometry. And so this is, this is still not exact. You know, this is plus you know, some higher order stuff, but it's a better approximation. And once you believe this, uh, Oh, I guess I should have done something else a little bit first. Uh, well, I apologize. I got things a little bit out of order, but this actually implies uh, a very interesting relationship. So if I take two boundary density operators on A that have the same entanglement wedge, uh, okay? So when I do this optimization, I get the same region. Jafferis, Lukwitz, uh, Maldesena, and Sue showed that to leading order, the relative entropy between these boundary density operators and the bulk, de the bulk corresponding bulk density operators is the same. So what is this saying? Well, if I have two boundary density operators and the area con uh, under the assumption that they have the same entanglement wedge, the area contributions to their entropies will be the same, right? And so the only difference in the entropies of the operators will come from the entropies of their bulk fields, not from the geometry. Because by hypothesis, they have the same geometry, okay? Uh, and you can actually argue that just from this formula, uh, the structure of this formula implies it has to lift to relative entropy as well. Okay, so the, the entropy statement, the Ryu Takianagi formula, implies the same is true uh, for relative entropies. Uh. Now this is useful for quantum error correction. So remember this configuration, where A1 was a pretty long interval, A2 is a pretty long interval, and the separation between those intervals was relatively small. In this case, when you go to calculate Ryu Takianagi, the surfaces that matter are those ones, right? But in the background, there are these other alternative surfaces, which are the ones that would have mattered, uh, or, that are the minimal surfaces for A1 and A2 individually, right? That if I only wanted the entropy of A1, I would get this top dotted line. If I only wanted the entropy of A2, I'd get this bottom dotted line. And it turns out that the HKLT, or HKLT, no, HHLT, <laughs> I'm getting my initials confused. Uh, Hamilton Kabat Lifshitz Low, uh, HKLL, uh, the HKLL prescription allows you to push operators in A1, uh, in little a1 to big A1. It allows you to push operators in little a2 to big A2, but it doesn't allow you to push operators here in the middle out to the boundary, right? So let's call this top, middle, and bottom. So Hamilton, Kabat, Lifshitz, Low allows you to do quantum error correction, or it's not really quantum error correction, but uh, allows you to push 
top and bottom to A1, A2, right? That if you have an, if you have an observable in either the top or the bottom, you can write it uh, as an observable on A1, A2 uh, on the boundary. But quantum error correction techniques actually tell us that we can push top, middle, and bottom all the way out to A1, A2. And so quantum error correction uh, actually allows us to go further than what was previously known uh, about pushing bulk operators out to the boundary in ADS-CFT. Uh, so it's not just reinterpreting results that were pre-existing, uh, that this is you know, really qualitatively new, that if I have an observable sitting right here uh, in the middle of ADS space with quantum error correction techniques, and actually uh, using universal recovery maps, uh, paper due to Mark and, uh, and Marius and, and company, uh, we can write down a formula for pushing the operator out to the boundary that wasn't known before. Um, and the, it, I have run out of time, so I, all, all I will say is that the way that it works uh, hinges on this equality of bulk and boundary relative entropies. Because universal recovery maps, uh, what they tell you is that uh, if you don't lose too much relative entropy under a quantum channel, then there is a way to approximately reverse the quantum channel. Uh, and the fact that these bulk and boundary relative entropies are very close to each other uh, allows us to construct a channel and apply the recovery map, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in order to do the quantum error correction. Uh, and not only that, you can even write down a formula which is pretty compact. And so again, in the high energy physics world, uh, they had this prescription HKLL that involves solving some partial differential equations for saying you know, some method uh, of getting access to uh, the bulk observables. Now we can go deeper into the bulk and I can tell you very compactly uh, what it's doing. I'll, I'll, write, I'll, I'll say some words, right? It's the response of the modular Hamiltonian to a perturbation uh, of the bulk density operator in the direction of the, uh, the observable that you want. Uh, so, those are some words that don't mean too much to you, but I could say it in a sentence, right? Whereas before, someone had to sit down and spend 20 minutes actually defining, you know, boundary conditions from some PDEs, blah, 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 right? Uh, and so there's real progress there. Um, before I let you go, I just wanted to mention a few of the other exciting things that have happened. Most of what I'm telling you here, I think all of it maybe, happened in 2000, before 2017. So, in 2000, or 2017 and earlier, one of the exciting developments um, is I, sometimes people have, you know, quantum information theorists, when they've had too much to drink, you know, they sit back and they, you know, they, they, they speculate, in, you know, maybe in the, uh, in the teleportation protocol, how does the quantum information actually travel from Alice to Bob, right? Does it travel backwards in time through the entanglement, uh, and then, you know, backwards and forwards in time, or, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and I thought that these discussions um, had no content, even though I engaged in them, uh, and even maybe wrote a paper about it at one point, uh, my first paper ever. Uh, but, uh, let's see, uh, Jafferis, Wall, and Gao uh, have identified a quantum gravity dual to, te to teleportation. So they set up a geometry in which the state is an entangled state, and they describe a protocol, which is basically teleportation. Uh, and in that protocol, the quantum gravity dual of teleportation is traveling through a traversable wormhole, which is created by the entanglement, right? So that, that I think is beautiful, right? There's an actual operational dual interpretation of what it means to be teleported. Um, there's been a lot of work on quantum chaos uh, that really came, uh, that was motivated by quantum information. And this was a, a paper that I wrote with John Preskill about 10 years ago about uh, information recovery from black holes, focused a lot of attention on chaos in black holes, uh, and since then there's been a huge development, uh, and you know, lots of things that have been done, Lee Robinson bounds, you know, tight bound, universal bounds exported to general quantum systems, originally motivated by holography, blah, 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 uh, but it's really a story where ideas from quantum information have had a, a large impact on high energy physics, now actually condensed matter physics as well. Um, there's a whole, community of people, or a number of people who thought about tensor networks in high energy physics. I ba barely mentioned them here. Uh, but the 
the states that play a major role in ADS-CFT are states that have very suggestive tensor net representations. And so initially Brian Swingle, but then many others have thought about that. And I'd like to get, make a shout out to Toby Cubitt and Tamara Kohler, who've written a very interesting recent paper uh, about how to connect tensor networks and dynamics uh, in, uh, in ADS-CFT. Um, Maybe I should stop there. There's, yeah, there's a longer list, but the, the basic message is that there is a lot happening right now. Like this is, I think we really are making progress on answering questions that were confusing and uh, unresolved for a long time. Uh, and these are questions about some of the most uh, fundamental uh, issues in physics, right? What is space? Uh, it's a good question to, to be able to make some headway on. And so if you're interested, I really encourage people from quantum information to try to get involved. Like it is, it is intimidating, like diving into the high energy literature, it's huge and it's very technical, uh, but we have a number of workshops. If you're interested, you know, contact me because there's a deficit of quantum information talent in this business. There are a lot of high energy theorists who've learned a bit of quantum information. There are very few quantum information theorists who've learned a bit of high energy. Uh, I, I'm in that category. You know? um, and with that, thank you for your attention and enjoy your lunch. Thank you.